the usual flow, we will have um, 25 to 30 minutes of Farah presenting and then an equal amount of discussion when she's done. Go ahead, Farah. Great, well, thanks. I just wanna say it's an awesome moment to be here at, at Ruby because I feel like um, the zeitgeist is actually waking up to rural, the importance of the rural electorate. And I'm on the op-ed page in the New York Times over the last week, we've seen three different pieces uh, about rural voters, rural rage. Um, anyway, what, whatever you think of those pieces, to me, it tells me that people are starting to realize that rural people exist, that they're not going anywhere, and that we ought to care what's going on with them. And so that's all, uh, that's all good news. Um, uh, the, the people I'm going to introduce you today uh, to today are um, three steel workers from a bearing plant in Indianapolis um, called Rexnord that moved away to Mexico in uh, in 2017. And two of them, I guess, classify as rural voters. Uh, two of them live sort of in the cornfields uh, outside of Indianapolis and drove in maybe 30 minutes to get to work. So I guess I can, uh, I can say that I have something to say about <laughs> rural voters. Um, I uh, I started this journey um, right around the, right after Trump's election in 2016. I want to kind of take you back to how um, shocked a lot of people were, and I don't know if you want to go back there, but um, but uh, oh, so many people were asking, how is it that millions of Americans voted for a man who had not served even one day in office, not even one day, not even as on a school board. How is it that he became president? And right after um, right after the election, I was talking to some people in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. And I, I kept hearing like, oh, he's going to save our factory. He's going to bring the factories back. And that's one of the reasons I got interested in, in following a plant, um, a plant closing really closely to really see like, what does that feel like to to have your job move away because people on the other side of the border were gonna work for $3 an hour when, when you work for $25 an hour. Um, and I, I, uh, I ended up uh, choosing Rex Nord because Trump had tweeted about this plant. Right after his election, he tweeted like, Rex Nord is viciously closing down and moving away no more. And like, you know, these workers really hung on those words, no more, no more. And they kept asking themselves like for two weeks, they said like, does it mean that our jobs are saved? Does it mean that, that no more factories are gonna close after this one? They really took him literally. And um, I ended up um, hanging out, going to Indianapolis and hanging out in the union hall there and meeting, uh, meeting some of these characters for the first time. And it was packed with journalists because Trump at that point had started this Twitter war with the union leader. And I, you know, it was just this crazy story, like what's going on here? And I ended up following, um, following them first as the plant closed down for seven months. And then I ended up following them for four years to really see like, where did they end up? How did it change their worldview? Um, what did their sex lives, their kids, like, Everything is impacted when your when your job moves away, and I have this whole other spiel about mental health, physical health, all of the things that come with a job that that are totally besides uh, the a paycheck. Um, this presentation, though, I want to drill down on a couple of themes. Um, race, the theme of race versus class. If you remember correctly, back. At that moment, um, where I live in the East Coast, uh, the academics and journalists were involved in this very um, serious debate about whether these people voted for Trump because of racism or economic grievance. This was the this was the the debate going on at that time there. And I just want to let's see if my okay here's one uh, here's one um, example of an academic paper. Um, that brings this dichotomy. Uh, and here's a, an example of Vox, something in Vox um, uh, that shows this, there were a flurry of headlines uh, debating this and pretty quickly they decided it was racism. It was racial anxiety, not economic anxiety. And they, they settled on this um, partly because of some compelling research. This is a study out of Tufts um, that 
showed strong correlations between uh, attitudes about race and support for Trump. And so you saw a whole bunch of headlines saying, why are we even talking about this anymore? It's settled, it was racism, and there's no economic grievance. Um, they looked at things like income. The average Trump supporter was making something like $70,000 a year. So they're fine. This is not about economics. Um, so that was the debate going on here. And I just want to dr drill down really a little bit on this particular study um, just for a minute and, and indulge me for one minute. The headline said racism, sobering role of racism. But when you actually read the study, what they were tracking was racism denial. Um, you were classified as a, as a racist in the study um, if you did not think that white people had advantages because of this color of their skin, or if you thought that racial problems were rare. If you denied the narrative that um, race was playing a central, a central role in American life, in all aspects of American life, you were classified and seen as as a, as a racist in this study. And it was interesting because um, it's the best predictor of people who voted for Obama in, in, 20, uh, in 2012 and Trump in 2016 was this, this idea that racism was not a central factor and that white people really didn't have advantages. I take issue with. I, to me, the advantages of white people are obvious, and and this and and the and the work being done to shed light about race and its central role in the United States is very important. But the the this um, the way in which this argument was used to to kind of um, silence legitimate economic grievances is something that I have taken issue with since I started meeting these steel workers. And we'll get into that. So let's just, I'll keep this in the back of your mind. We'll, we'll return to it in a, in a minute. Um, so the first person I wrote about, I did a big piece on her in the, in the New York Times that came out in the fall of 2017. This is Shannon Mulcahy. She, um, she was a female steel worker. She was the very first woman to operate the furnaces at the factory. Um, in Indianapolis. She had worked her way up from janitor to heat treat operator, um, which was one of the most dangerous and highly paid jobs uh, on the factory floor. They worked with explosive gases. Whether you liked it or not, you put your life in, in her hands when you walked in that plant. Um, she had been a, a battered woman uh, who really was able to leave a dangerous man and because of this job, it gave her the confidence and the money she needed to leave and be the breadwinner of her family. That's her daughter who was applying to college, the first person in her family to apply to college at the time. And she really was proud of her job. She was really proud of how she'd worked her way up. The men hadn't wanted to train her, but, um, but uh, they did. They were forced to train her. And they played every prank in the book to try to get her to quit. But because she'd had this really traumatic history of being uh, abused, she wasn't going to let them push her out of that job opportunity. And she tried, you know, she ended up sweet talking uh, the oldest guy in, in the heat treat department into um, training her and teaching her everything she knew. So um, when I met her, she was in an existential crisis. The plant was closing. She was having to decide whether she was going to train her Mexican replacement. And um, she ultimately decided that she would. She wanted the extra money. She needed it. Her, her daughter's going to college. And she, so she, she trained them. And she ended up um, forming this bond with this young Mexican guy who was the same age as her son. And um, she... She taught him everything that Stan Settles had taught her. And I, it was the first time I realized the importance of training and the kinship that it requires. When you're a blue collar worker, your, your fellow workers train you and, or they don't, right? And when you train someone, 
it means you're giving them something valuable. And it's the monopoly on training is, is a very powerful tool. It's a, it's a way individuals and unions uh, and controlled, um, controlled uh, it, it's a form of power. So anyway, she tra she trains this guy and at the end, she, he, he takes her aside and he, he, he puts his hand on his heart and he says, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't realize that I was coming to Indianapolis to learn this job that was gonna be taken from you. And um, she said, I was blessed to have this job. I hate to see it go, but now it's your turn to be blessed. And so when you when you listen to that story, you think, well, if workers like Shannon are mad that their job is moving to Mexico, does that quite is that economic uh, anxiety or is that racial anxiety? Like where does that fall? And if if they're mad that the blue collar jobs that remain in Indianapolis, painting houses. Uh, landscaping, um, roofing, if they're mad that those jobs are being done by undocumented immigrants for less than what a native born American would charge, where does that fall? Economic anxiety or uh, racial uh, anxiety? So when you really look at lives, how people actually live their lives, how these, how these concepts actually play out in real life, it's almost impossible to disentangle the two. It's a very disingenuous binary that we're having in, in, the, in, in the academic sphere. It doesn't actually um, say anything about how, how people, uh, how, how they're experiencing these, these things. So um, I wanna move on to John. Let's see, there's John Feltner. He was uh, another person I followed. He was the union vice president. He was the most militant union person I've ever met. When you talk to him, it sound, he sounds sometimes like Karl Marx. To him, the world was divided between labor and capital, between the greedy companies and the working man. He really, uh, he really, really deeply believed this. He came from a long line of union uh, men. His his grandfather was a United coal worker. His great grandfather was a United coal worker. These were people who fought literal wars against the coal company in Kentucky. Um, his grandfather's coal mine uh, his, it was under a strike um, in the 60s at one time, and they blew up a coal tipple. They literally blew it up so that scabs couldn't come in and load the coal onto the trains. And the company planted a bomb under the union leader's house. So this is how deep it was. So try to tell John about white privilege and you will see like the hair like rise up on the back of his neck because to him, like decent conditions weren't a gift to his family because they were white. It was something they fought for, and some of them died for that. And so to him, the whole history of the labor movement was a history of, um, of struggle. And it was a history that I had never known before because I had never learned it in school. In, in fact, some of these in West Virginia, you know, there were there was a, an attempt to suppress this history, not to put it in the in the textbooks. The Blair Mountain, uh, even the descendants of the people who fought in, in Blair Mountain didn't know what what that was all about. So um, I'm not excusing the idea that um, that racism existed in this plant. It did exist. Of course it did. Um, but a guy like John will have a very different definition of racism than the one we, we looked at um, earlier. Um, John was an interesting guy because he, was op he openly talked about how he had been a Democrat. All his life, he'd been a Democrat. His dad had been a Democrat. His granddad, his great granddad, they were all uh, believed that the Democratic Party was for the working man and the Republican Party was for the, you, those greedy, greedy bastards. You didn't vote for them. And um, he believed in Bill Clinton. He supported Bill Clinton. He believed Bill Clinton when Bill Clinton said NAFTA is going to create good paying American jobs, blue collar jobs. Um, and he believed in it right until the factories started moving away not just because of NAFTA, but also because of China's entrance into WTO, 
which was also something that Clinton uh, Clinton signed up on, uh, signed up to. So um, John changed his attitude towards the Democratic Party after that. He his his first plant moved away in uh, 2004. It moved to Alabama, and then so this is was the second plant closing. And uh, going through a plant closing is almost like going through a death. Like it, it just changes you. He he changed uh, he changed his worldview. And when um, he used to tell his kids, if a Democrat's in office, old dad has a job. And if a Republican gets in there, old dad's out of work. He stopped telling his kids that. And in in two thousand eight, he voted for Obama because Obama had promised to renegotiate NAFTA. And when Obama did not uh, do it, he stopped calling himself a Democrat. So um, uh, John, when the, when, when, the fact, when the bosses came and said the factory was closing, John went through that plant and said, do not train your replacement. None of us should train our replacements. We should stand together as a union and refuse because that's the way to save our jobs, right? That's the way, do not, you know, they're gonna bring your replacement in here, say no. Um, uh, that's what he literally thought was morally right as a union person, as a union guy. He, and he saw everybody who trained as a scab who crossing a picket line, that's how he saw it. Um, now, a lot of the black men in the plant did not agree. And when they heard John saying, don't train your replacement, they heard racism. Don't train them, don't train the Mexicans, right? A lot of those um, black men had never forgiven the union for the way that it had treated their fathers, the way that it had treated their uncles. And um, it was a real divide. It was, uh, it was something that prevented them from speaking with one voice when that factory closed. And it, it drove John um, ballistic because he's saying, I, you're my black union brother. We have far more in common with each other than, than that white CEO, right? But, um, but somehow uh, they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't stand together as a union. Um, the last person uh, I followed was Wally Hall. Um, Wally was a beloved, uh, person on the factory floor, one of the hardest workers in the plant. Um, I met him at a union rally where he gave this very stirring speech about the need for interracial solidarity. We got to stand together and fight y'all. That's what he was telling them. And after the speech, there was this long line of, of white guys and Harley Davidson jackets and um, just waiting to give him a hug to thank him for his speech. I was the last person in that line. When I came up to talk to him, I thought he was still going to be fiery like he had in his talk. And he said, oh, you know, ain't no, ain't no um, point in being mad. We got to move on. That's what he told me. And he said, me personally, I'm going to start a barbecue. And he gave me a business card. He was the first person I met, the only person I met who actually had a plan for what was going to happen after the factory closed. It was his dream to start a barbecue business. He came from a, a family of entrepreneurs. Although all of them worked in factories, they all had side hustles. They all had side businesses. Um, and they, um, you know, they, they thought of self-employment as the high watermark. Because if you were self-employed, no racist could control your fate. And uh, it was really a lesson of how psychologically, Wally was far more psychologically prepared for the plant to close than his white union brothers, because he never was up under the illusion that the, that the company cared about him. He'd worked, uh, he'd done other things, right? A lot of the white guys that he was working with had been in that plant since high school. Their fathers had worked there since high school. They, the job had been like a family heirloom to them. And it wasn't really the case um, with as many of the Black workers. Although I have to say, you had to know somebody to get in there. Even as a Black worker, probably especially as a Black worker, you had to know somebody to get, to get in there. Um, uh, I'll tell a quick story about Wally's... Um, uh, 
the the white men, some of the white men who had worked there since high school were so distraught that the plant was closing that they started destroying the machines. And they uh, there were lots of rumors uh, that machines were being rewired so that when they got to Mexico and were plugged in, they would explode. There was a fire in a truck. Um, there, there was a, there were little tiny delicate parts to these machines that somehow got lost. So sabotage was, a, was something that a lot of the union guys felt, um, felt justified in, in doing. I, I didn't meet a single black man who, uh, who thought that was, uh, okay. Um, Wally walks through the plant one night and he comes across one of his white union brothers, uh, he catches him red-handed in the act of sabotage. And the guy freezes. He's not sure what Wally's gonna do. Is Wally gonna turn him in? What? Wally opened his arms wide and he gave his white union brother this giant bear hug. And he hugs this guy until the man's legs gave out under him. The man was weeping and his legs gave out under him. And Wally told me he was holding him up like a rag doll. And Wally whispers in his ear, even if you tear it up, they're still gonna move away. That ain't how we're gonna walk out of here. I'll tell you how you're supposed to walk out of here. Like you came in, standing on two legs. So it to me, it was a, a real illustration of how these two people, you think, well, they have the same economic interests, right? They're, they're literally working in the same plant and, and it's moving away, but they had totally different reactions to it based on their own personal history, their own personal experience. Um, Wally, uh, Wally was able to get that job at that plant because of his uncle Hewlin. And his uncle Hewlin was able to get a job in that plant because of the NAACP and, and the Civil Rights Act. Um, Wally's uncle had been a sharecropper in Georgia, who moved up to Indianapolis in 1962. And he, he, he wanted to get a job in a factory where you could earn a heck of a lot more um, than, than sharecropping. And uh, he had he heard from some girl at the NAACP that he should go apply for a job at Rexnord. He had he didn't have a car at the time, so he walked like five miles from the YMCA, the colored YMCA at the time, to uh, to the plant. And of course, they said, "Well, we don't have any any job openings." I'm sorry. He goes to turn around and go walk the five miles home, and a, a black man in a suit appeared out of nowhere almost like an angel. And he said, go back in and tell him to give you the test. So Wally's Uncle Hewlin goes back in and says, I want the test. So they had to give him the test, which he passes. And they gave him another test, which he passes. They told him to come back the next day for another test, which he passes. And finally, they have to give him a job. But they don't give him a job operating in a machine. They give him a job as a janitor, which the only, there are a few black men working in that plant and they were working as janitors. And um, so uh, Wally's uncle Hewlin complained and said, uh, hey, I pay the same union dues as you and, I, and all these other men, but they earn twice what I make operating a machine. I've been to technical school. Do you think I can't operate a machine? And the union steward said, oh, we know you can operate a machine. Of course you can. Um, it's just that there's only so many jobs in this building. And if, if we give you a job, then that's one less job for my son or his nephew or his son-in-law. That's one less job for one of us. And so I almost called the book, and that was the original name of the book, One of Us, because who you hire, who you train, whose jobs you protect and whose jobs you throw under the bus, that is the clearest expression of who you consider to be your kin, who you consider to be your tribe. And, you know, there's a lot of, again, these academic studies that say, oh my goodness, these 
these working class white people, they, they think in a zero sum way. And, you know, if, if um, they think that if black people get ahead, white people fall behind. But there's a reason for that. There's only so many jobs in this building, right? Jobs are finite and zero sum. And so what we have to appreciate is that the, the Civil Rights Act is what allowed Black people and women to go and, and demand uh, the right to operate a machine on the factory floor. And that was what civil rights meant in a lot of these blue collar settings. And as soon as they got those jobs, those plants started moving away. And so now you have a larger group of people competing over a shrinking pool of jobs, right? That's not a recipe for racial peace. It's not a recipe for um, uh, for uh, for for viewing race in an enlightened way. It's it, it if you if 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 you really dissect uh, the way that uh, race plays out on the factory floor in 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 those environments, there is a sense of hey, we had a monopoly on these jobs, and now now you're here, and you know you're my union brother, I love you, but. Um, but now this plant is moving to Mexico too much, enough. It was like they, it was more than they could take. Um, so I guess uh, I wanna, I, how are we doing on time here? I can't see my clock. If you could wrap up in the next couple of minutes, that'd be great, Farah, if that's possible. Okay. Well, so going back to this, um, going back to this idea um, of, the definition of racism. I think this is a, this is a, I'm, I don't take issue with this definition of racism. I think it's, it, but it's, it's a college educated person's definition of racism. I'm not sure it's a definition of racism that everybody on a factory floor would, would agree with. And um, I just want to go through that, you know, this idea that it's either race, racism or economic grievance. And, and without recognizing the interplay between the two, um, I think causes us to miss a lot. This is uh, Tahanisi Coates talking about how Trump won every, every um, uh, demographic of white people. And so, it, you know, we're wrong to focus on the class divide. But, you know, when you focus on, on race alone, you miss, you miss some pretty big pieces. He, he, he was actually wrong because college educated whites did vote for Hillary Clinton um, and, 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 and the class divide in 2016 was huge. And, and, and it, it was a big, big story and it's a continuing, it's a continuing story. So I guess um, what I want you to take away is that, you know, this is a false dichotomy in real life. Economic anxiety versus racial anxiety is a false dichotomy. It's not, um, uh, I think uh, life is life is more complicated than this e either or. Um, and to me, the right question is not whether uh, people voted for Trump as one or the other, but how do we use valid grievances, both around race and around economic precarity? How do we use those valid grievances to build a multiracial, multi-class coalition that actually meets the needs of people? And most Americans. Um, and I, 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 the last thing I would say is that John and Shannon were both persuadable voters. I, I consider them persuadable voters. I think that John, um, I, I, John could be brought back to the Democratic Party. He could have been brought back to the idea that um, you have to talk about race and the, the history, the legacy, the, the terrible legacy that unions have to answer for. Um, in order to be stronger. I think if I think you could have made arguments uh, to John, I did make arguments to John that said, you have to acknowledge um, what unions did in order to win the trust of your black union brothers and sisters, right? Um, you have to acknowledge the history. But on the other side, I think we also have to acknowledge that language around white supremacy and white privilege are not necessarily um, going to uh, 
bring John along. He, he's not in a mood to be lectured to by college educated people about his privilege because he doesn't feel particularly privileged as the laid off factory worker twice, laid off twice, and a guy who's seen his own um, income decline from $28 an hour 10 years ago to $18 an hour today. So those are, um, it, you know, that's what we're sort of dealing with, a, a perfect storm of, of this particular kind of white, white, uh, white working class uh, person who has seen his privileges ebb away at the very time that um, the colleges and universities are talking a lot about white privilege and white supremacy and want him to acknowledge it. So anyway, I think let's open it up to questions. Um, I think I think we'll we'll have a good discussion. If you would um, stop sharing screen and then we'll all be able to see each other. Thank you for that. Wonderful presentation, Farrell. We're, we have about 30 minutes for questions and discussion. The With this number of participants, we encourage folks by and large to put their questions in the chat and um, I will be monitoring those. Erica's gonna look for people who raise hands. That's okay too, we can have people come off. But if you do verbalize a question, if you could keep it short and sweet so we can get as many people into the conversation as possible, that would be great. So um, I let's start. I'm gonna I'm gonna get into the chat box and start with the very first one. And then as as people raise hands, Erica can flag those as well. So Bruce has asked whether studies differentiate attitudes between closures of plants that moved from one part of the US to another versus those that go overseas. Do you know of anything that's distinguished that? It's a good question. I haven't actually, I don't think people have studied these, this population very much. I think, um, you know, I feel like um, we're just catching up, honestly. Um, I, uh, the, the China shock work done by, um, by MIT um, Arturo, um, he's an he's an, uh, an economist, I believe, but he did a lot of uh, work on um, uh, suicide rates or uh, ch children born out of wedlock. Um, th this kind of stuff, marriage rates of men uh, in places that were affected by uh, plant closures. Um, but I don't think anybody actually talked to individual people, right? A lot of times these studies are very um, 5,000 foot. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know that that's been done. Thank you. Heidi's asking if you know how they feel now. I presume, Heidi, you're talking about um, the people that you studied at the plant. If you would, and, and particularly, do you think any of them kind of went for Biden in 2020, if you have any insight into that? Yes. Uh, yes. So Shannon did go. Uh, Shannon uh, ended up getting recruited by um, by a Bernie Sanders group, and she ended up uh, going to protest Trump at at, at uh, Trump rallies. And um, it was really fascinating uh, to see her transition. It was she she um, this was COVID. I kind of don't want to spoil the the book because I'm hoping you read it. But um, but she she had a really quick turnaround, um, and it was all based. A lot of it was based on her own personal experience and COVID. She had lost her job another time, a second time because of COVID. Um, John voted for Trump in 2020, but um, but when uh, it was declared that Biden won, he said, "Stop being a crybaby." You know, like he 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 sort of got disgusted with Trump's claiming to have won, and uh, on January sixth, he he was shocked and and shocked by the by Trump's actions and uh, and it it was he you know I I I haven't talked to him about what he thinks about Trump running in twenty twenty four. I'm like afraid to talk about that, but, um, but uh, I think, yeah, I think that um, we did see people move a largely because of COVID. That's encouraging. 
Um, Mona asks if you think that sexism was an even greater factor than either race or economic anxiety in the 2016 election. So, I mean, sexism is uh, was all. Yes, these are these are guys who have very uh, traditional views, but you have to understand as well that many of their households are only afloat right now because their wives went to work. Um, you um, so so John had been the major breadwinner uh, back in his first plant, and his wife stayed at home. And the second plant closing, he only survived because she had a job. And his whole marriage changed a lot when he lost his job. He lost, uh, you know, his wife began calling the shots. She's the one. <laughs> She's the one. Uh, and she worked in HR. Um, so there's a lot in the book about. She, and she was a Hillary Clinton supporter. Um, so it was it. it I think. Um, uh, I also think, though, that for this subset of voters, um, you can't discount the fact that Hillary Clinton was Bill Clinton's wife. The anger at Bill Clinton and NAFTA was real. And I, I mean, a lot of people would never have voted for Bill Clinton's wife, even if they might have voted for another woman. But I, I don't want to discount that uh, that sexism is 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 real and played a and played a role. Of course, it did just as racism did. Um, great, great. The next question is from Tess, who asks, doesn't the, the zero sum game that you mentioned, that, that view of job scarcity depend on accepting the original conditions that it's white men that are the, the ones that are either only or more deserving of jobs? Well, I will say that the loss of an unfair advantage still feels like a loss. Mm. And I'm not saying that we should uh, accept that the existence of unfair advantages, but to, um, to not acknowledge that um, th the losses just means that you're not seeing what's really going on. You're not understanding some real economic conditions going on in people's lives. Uh, for instance, when you lose your job at a plant, I mean, it seems like a small thing, but you lose all your seniority. Even if you get another job at another plant, you're going to be working the night shift. You might never see your wife again because she works the day shift. Um, and so like these, these were little things that actually they, uh, you know, even after people got another job, they still weren't whole. They still didn't feel whole. And so I guess I just when it, my um, I'm I'm heartened by by um, by the attempts I'm seeing at forming multiracial coalitions. Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us, is a really great articulation of what we all lose when we accept um, that racism is going to shut down our public pools. Um, I, I love her and I love that book. Um, there's also a woman named uh, Betsy uh, Leonard Wright, who has a toolkit about how activists can um, uh, organize across class lines and avoid some of the pitfalls. Um, so I guess uh, <sighs> Zero sum thinking, I'm not saying I, ex I accept that that's where we have to end up, but I think we have to understand where it comes from. And I also think we have to understand that um, when we explain concepts like solidarity, you can explain it in a way that would appeal to a union person or a person from uh, a, a union background. Um, if you use it, if you use language from a graduate school, you know, language you had to go to graduate school to 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 learn. You're 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 going to be alienating, and and I don't think that that is. Um, I don't I don't think it works to go to to these people and and force them to use the same words that your you know graduate school professor would use. I, I, and I just don't I don't I think that that doesn't get us where we need to be. Thank you. That's spoken. That, that's Ruby talk right there. I love it. That's great. Um, 
Skip asks about whether you have experience with ESOPs, employee stock ownership programs, where it's not a co-op, but they uh, own a share. Some companies are 100% ESOP, and whether or not that ownership stake in a company maybe changes the psychology of the workers involved. It's an interesting question because part, part, I have a chapter in the book which traces the history of Rexnord and, you know, early on, um, the the owners of the plant thought that if more employees had stock, um, that it would be a, a successful company. They actually had a goal of 40% ownership um, of stock by, by employees. And, um, you know, how much things have changed, right? So, and then, uh, you know, by the time that plant closed, the, the company had been bought and sold by two different private equity um, giants who were just kind of uh, borrowing money off it and selling it for parts, borrowing money and to putting the money in their pocket. And then the company has to go on after they sell it and repay the loan. Um, so stakeholder capitalism and sh versus shareholder capitalism is, is a, is a worthy subject. I don't, you know, I don't know that these workers were, um, were very interested in, um, you know, the corporate life of the company. Um, but I, I do, it's an interesting question. Thank you. Don is talking about the fact that this trend goes back to the 1970s, the deindustrialization uh, de 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 of cities. And he talks about his, his own dad who was working in factories in Trenton. Yeah. And then the, the reality that the Democratic Party started to abandon working folks around that time, certainly through the 80s, 90s, and, and present, so that we no longer have any party or any really strong faction within a party that is really, really focused on working class folks. And he says, what the hell do we do about the situation? So again, Ruby has some thoughts on that, but I want you to talk first about that. Sarah. I think it's changing. I think you're starting to see a lot more interest in unions among young people. You're seeing more union actions. You're seeing strikes. You're seeing, I mean, there's, there is sort of a class consciousness uh, democratic socialism is bringing back sort of some of these ideas. Um, I don't know if they're the places that are unionizing are um, are fat are factories. I think, uh, um, you know, they might be coffee houses or um, you know architectural firms. Interestingly, graduate school students are are unionizing. So it's it's a different kind of uh, person, but. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I do think that there's something to this. The reason that factories moved out to the Midwest was that unions got too strong in, in New York, right? And then, and then they moved to the South and, and then they moved overseas. And so there is a cat and mouse game here. And I just think, um, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's tough, uh, to come up with a solution, but I, I do know that, the way I think about Donald Trump is that he promised these people their jobs back. And he said, your job has moved, your factory has moved to a place that doesn't have a minimum wage. There is no requirement for healthcare. There's no environmental protections, right? Um, we're gonna bring your job back. We're gonna get rid of minimum wage. We're not gonna have health health care, <laughs> right? We're, we're, we're not gonna have it. We're gonna roll back all the environmental protections but you'll have your job. That was kind of the deal that he offered people. And there were a lot of people who were willing to take it. Um, there's a lot of people who have ambivalent feelings about unions now because they do think that unions played a role in, in, in making jobs too expensive. Um, so I, I, don't know, uh, I don't know where that ends up, but I do know that one of my uh, learnings from this uh, experience was that we need universal health care because people, uh, you know, when you lose your job and you lose your health care, it's, it's deadly. Um, a, a lot of people can get by, um, you know, with cobbling jobs together as long as they have health care. And um, so if you end up reading the book, you'll see that there's a lot of ties to health care in each of the characters by the end of their life or by the end of my, my time following them. Thank you. Uh, Don, I'll just add that uh, this is really Ruby's reason for being is 
to um, lift up rural people and, and working class folks more broadly, but particularly in the rural context, and reposition rural lives, rural communities, working values in the Democratic Party, make it central again to the Democratic Party. Because it's even though the Republicans are the or the rhetorical populists now, there's really nothing about the policies from them that is in any way supportive of working people or let alone rural working people. So we really have a number of things underway. I don't know if you have signed up at the Ruby website, but if you do that, you'll hear about not only other briefings, but other things we're doing. So this that is our reason for being is trying to get a politics that works for rural and working people again. Uh, I'm going to go to Erica's question. Erica, you why don't you just come off and ask it? Sure. Um, so you had mentioned that um, you know how uh, some of the people you interviewed had like a very prickly response when you brought up the concept of white privilege or white supremacy, which I totally understand. I've heard that a lot. One one thing I'm wondering is like how how are these concepts? that are very much in currency, like in academia and in social justice circles, how are they hitting the radar of people who aren't part of that world? Is it just so much part of our mainstream culture at this point? It's very alienating to them. And I think, uh, I think I have a whole book in a uh, chapter in my book called White Privilege, and it was the hardest chapter to write because I was trying to wrestle with this notion. On the one hand, John's privileges were obvious right? As a white man, he didn't have to worry about whether his co-workers would train him. He assumed that they would, right? He didn't have to worry about whether he could buy a house in, you know, a new subdivision uh, out in the cornfields and whether his neighbors would accept him or not there, or whether they would accept his kids. There were so many ways that he just accepted, you know, um, it, it, it was not obvious to him that he had privilege. Even, even, uh, even over his wife, uh, who he who he forced to quit a job uh, that she loved at one point because um, because he didn't want her working. So like th there was that. But on the other hand, I am a Harvard graduate who works at the New York Times. I have both my parents have PhDs. What does it mean for me to go and lecture him about his privilege? Right? It, isn't that surreal? Isn't there a bit of, uh, isn't that a little bit surreal? Um, and so um, I, I, I do think that when you talk to a guy like John, you can get him to admit your union didn't treat black people right for a long time. And as a result, there aren't as many legacies in the plant. There aren't as many uh, people who can say that their grandfather worked at this plant or that their father worked at this plant. Um, and that has an impact. And it has an impact on, on your union today because black people don't feel as uh, much solidarity to it. So that's an impact on you, right? And he that's an argument I think he could hear. He could understand that argument. Um, and, and, you know, you could get him to, to see that acknowledging the historical wrongs is important to move forward together. And I think the unions actually have been, um, at least the, the clicky inner circles that run these things have been enough, um, attuned to the democratic talking points and to what's happening that they, um, have absorbed it and 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 they look for you know they they want to recruit black people into their inner circle they gave wally uh, a very highly coveted job because they wanted to show that they were inclusive um but i i just think there's a way that you can talk about the stuff that will let them listen and there's a way that will turn them off and uh absolutely turn them off um so you know, it's our choice if we want to try to 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 stuff uh, to stuff that message down their throat in a way that they're not going to hear. Um, I really think it it drives people into the arms of Trump, the the unpolitically correct um, Trump. Um, Thank you. It's a question here. It's a little complex, but I'll try to ask it, it's from Edward, and he's asking about 
how economists, a variety of them, including Paul Krugman at the New York Times, who, whom I'm usually in something of a rhetorical battle with most of the times that he writes about rural, um, but that he and others have, have analyzed uh, the problems of rural America and the economy and has basically decided that it's unresolvable, that nobody knows, I've one thing he's written, um, and particularly unresolvable without vast investments. Uh, I'll, I'll editorialize a bit on Edward's comment. Krugman has also said in the past that there've already been vast investments in rural and it hasn't added up to anything. Still, they're still poor and going downhill. So Edward says, they, these economists say that rural America must depend on cities. Cities are the engine of prosperity. What do you think of this? Isn't that a model for just more resentment and, and partisan hatred? to kind of adopt that, that economic model? Um, I will say that um, economists tend to be too 5,000 foot for me. I, I, would, I would love to see more economists look at human, human beings and, and actually uh, go and talk to the people that they're, who are being impacted by the policies that they are advocating. Um, I think a lot, you know, Krugman will say, and again, I can't, I don't want to criticize a colleague. I may have signed an agreement not to, but uh, in general, I will say uh, federal dollars going to a rural place doesn't mean that rural people are benefiting. There's a lot of companies in the, you know, agribusiness that get a lot of money federal from federal dollars. It doesn't mean it trickles down to communities and families. Um, I also think that, um, you know, when you look at a place that has gone from being a, a thriving place to everybody lives on disability, you know, it's hard to then say, well, you know, you should be grateful for those disability checks. I mean, yeah, they should be, but, uh, but in a way it's salt in the wound because people want jobs. They want to be relevant. And uh, a paycheck from Uncle Sam is not a, a it's not a paycheck in their mind. I, and that's that was one of the biggest things I learned was how much working class people can look down on those who survive off a government check. Um, we shouldn't be surprised that work is important to working class people. And I would also say that they are not it's not theoretical for them. They all had people in their immediate family that lived off food stamps or, or disability checks or, or something. And oftentimes it was a person who they didn't think worked as hard as they did, right? And so, um, you know, it's easy for those of us who live far away from, you know, we advocate the, for the poor, but we don't know anyone poor, right? Like, you know, there was a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, there was a lot of looking down on close relatives who could be trying harder to, to make a living, but didn't. But John, John drew the line at welfare. He, he, would, he would take um, unemployment insurance, sure, a system he'd paid into. Social security, a system he paid into. But welfare, you know, that was beyond the pale. Erica, is do you see any raised hands? No, there are no raised hands, but we would welcome people to raise their hands as we get into the final few minutes. And I think we've addressed everything in the chat so far. Okay, how about how about Mary? Uh, Mary, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, I was just writing this in the chat, but. So I lived in rural Ohio um, for about three hours directly east of Indianapolis. I was a UAW member when I worked at a Ford plant in 1972-73. In our town of 17,000, very rural, the Ford Chrysler Union Carbide and Cummings Engine plant all closed within the 10 years um, after I graduated from high school. It took me five years to sell my three bedroom house for $26,000. And at that time, the chant was the unions wanted too much. But I 
have come to realize that it wasn't the unions who wanted too much, that it was management who felt entitled to good pay, good benefits, uh, you know, freedom to choose, uh, you know, when they work to work good hours. You know, we were working uh, for almost a year. We were working six and seven days a week, no choice, even though we were union members because they negotiated that. Yeah. But it, it's not that the union people don't want to work and um, don't appreciate their jobs. It's that management found that it was cheaper to not pay benefits by moving all the things. The management still to this day, you know, so like my father worked for Ford, I was in the Ford factory uh, and those, the management people all to this day still have every benefit, all mm -hmm. the vacation, all the sick pay, all the uh, pensions, and yet they begrudge them for anybody else. So um, I have this theory that we don't live in a country that's cap capitalistic, it's corporate, it's run by corporations and the entitlement of the people running the corporations who by and large, and especially back when I was working there, they were white men. And you know, even when they wanted the bailout in 2008, they flew their corporate jets into town. It's the entitlement of management that we need to hit back on because that's still true. Um, yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Mary. So that's just but, a perspective yeah, I'd like to add. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you that in Heather McGee's book that Farah mentioned, that's also a strong theme about un uniting against those very entitled people at the top. Farah, you want to make some comments on that? Well, yeah, I just think that what, you know, there's a way in which we can, we can, uh, we can divide ourselves based on, 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 race and class and uh, we should be uniting against uh, you know uniting for the policies that will will benefit 95 percent of us um, um, I'm sorry I'm just looking looking at looking in this chat I was wondering where the plant moved that you were talking about Mary where did they go uh, they went to Mexico yeah and they also went to China you know parts some yeah. of the plants. So there were multiple plants. Union Carbide, you know, they went to India, you know, they went to other places, but all okay. out of the country because people within the United States felt entitled to uh, sure. benefits. And they so worked we hard and many people died in order to get them in Michigan, Ohio. Yeah. Um, so to me, the so moving the moving of plants, I I, you know, I understand the economic argument for it. But to me, that was the beginning of people feeling that the elite were not uh, were not in their corner, right? We're not in the same boat if uh, if if the company is an international company. And if you think about this this idea of who you give jobs to shows who, where your loyalties lie, right? Their loyalties aren't with the American people anymore, and it's not sure. It's not clear that they're even American companies. And I just want to end on this idea that I think the Biden administration gets this, and they have been doing a lot of things to um, to take the to take these problems. And um, so, for instance, the renegotiation of NAFTA, they have they're working to bring wages up in Mexico. Right? Why is it a race to the bottom? Let's bring up, it's never been done before. The American government has never gone around the world trying to raise wages elsewhere. That's what the Biden administration is trying to do. It's an interesting model. I have no idea if that's going to work. But I do think that they have internalized these lessons and they're trying. They're trying something else because the race to the bottom is just going to make the American working class think to to the to the level that that it is in other parts if you don't mind farrah we'll do one more question and then we'll wrap up there was a, a quick question from vicky about whether or not that toolkit you mentioned like where was that and and erica put something in the chat uh, about classism.org uh, is that the right is that the right link for that? I, yes, I um uh, I, that was one of my slides that I meant to uh, to bring it up. Um, that's her. Um, let me see if 
if that's the toolkit. Um, she, it's a, it's called the, uh, yes, missing class. Exactly. Um, she's really awesome. And she, she's basically trying to train activists because a lot of the activists out there, they are college educated. They come from a certain culture. So much of class is culture, right? And so you also have to train them to be able to talk maybe across class and make people feel welcome across class. Um, if you have, she, she tells uh, stories about, um, you know, having a vegan only dinner might not be a good idea if you're trying to recruit people from a, you know, an auto plant. Um, but, she, you know, she's she's really very smart on these issues. And I, I hope she can be brought into the conversation because I do think there's so many opportunities to, to form this cross-class um, coalition. And right now, as we speak, the Biden administration is spending a lot of money in rural on place-based development in rural areas and we'll see if it bears fruit a lot of these places are struggling to to figure out how to spend the money or um how to how to have community conversations around where that money should be directed and it's a real opportunity to um to to see if this can work great thank you so um Mona had the hand up, but I'm looking now and seeing this comment about the Michigan Democratic Party in 2017, initiating a full-time year-round organizing, serving all the counties, urban and rural areas, and the success in the November election at both the state level and the Supreme Court. Um, I'll just wrap up before we, we say goodbye by mentioning again next month, first uh, first Wednesday of the month, we'll have our next briefing. If you've not already signed up on Ruby's website, that's how you hear about the briefings and way more. We've got a great report about um, successful Democratic candidates in rural areas, and we've got a community works initiative that's similar to what's being talked about in Michigan getting underway. So a lot, a lot of opportunities to make a difference on this divide. Uh, Farah, I can't thank you enough. A wonderful presentation. If you've not read her book, Dog on it, get it, go buy it and read it. Um, it's really, really worth it and you will learn a great deal. So thank you again, Farah, very much for giving us this time and thanks to all of our many participants. Thanks everybody.